Hello, and welcome back to my Breadboard 486 project. Today, we are going to start working on the data bus. Now, to recap, the 486 has a 32-bit data bus, as you would expect for a 32-bit processor, and can also be run in both an 8-bit mode and a 16-bit mode. Now, one interesting caveat is that the location of the data on the bus doesn't change. Let me, let me see if I can simplify this. Some earlier processors would always put the 8-bit data on the bottom 8-bit bytes, the bottom 8 bits, and 16-bit on the bottom 16-bit. It didn't matter what the address of this was or the alignment. It would always, it'll always do that. 46 does not. So if you're requesting the second byte, it will go on to the second byte of the bus, and the third byte will go on the third byte of the bus. And same thing with a 16-bit. If you're requesting a six, you know, the low word, it will go here. High word will go here. And you know, you'd have different lines to enable the bytes of each D, of each word on the bus. Now this does require that we need to move the data around um, from the 8-bit bus to the various endpoints for the CPU bus. Now, luckily, not the hardest thing in the world. Uh, it actually only requires four chips. Four chips. The first one is a 74139. Uh, this is your standard 2 to 4 decoder. It takes in the two address lines and outputs which ad which 8-bit data. <laughs> it outputs which byte in the data bus that the data needs to be copied to. Um, as for the enable line, that is tied to the bus select 8 line. Now, technically at the moment, that's always going to be ground because we're, for the time being, this is just going to be a purely 8-bit system. I do intend eventually to have a 32-bit uh, RAM and 8-bit ROM, so this would actually need to be you know, enabled. Otherwise, for the moment, it's just actually going to be strapped to ground and always enabled. Now, in the case of the first byte into the data bus, we don't need to do anything. We can just pass it through. Um, and then the next byte, it goes into a 74245. Now, this, would, this is your standard bidirectional bus driver. And we would use the, read the right read line, both backwards and hard to pronounce, um, to determine the direction of the data. This works great because when this is high, we want to go from the A side to the B side. And high in this case means it's writing. So it's writing from the CPU bus to the data bus. Reading, it'll be low, so it's the data bus to the CPU bus. It's almost like it was designed that way. Probably was. And then the chip enable just attaches to the line for that particular bank. Now for the next two, it's exactly the same. We are just duplicating the same logic over and over. So yeah, the 8-bit data bus just gets spread across all four of these, well, three of these chips, and then just get passed to the four different parts of the data bus. This does mean that the low byte of the data bus will always have data on it. This is not a big problem. When the 4A6 is requesting an 8-bit an address, it's only going to read the lowest part of whatever it requests. So if it's trying to read 32 bits, but doing an 8-bit bus, it will only read 32 uh, 8 bits at a time. This means that even though we're writing data onto this, this particular bank, if it's not one that's enabled, and it's not one that's trying to read from, it'll ignore it. The, data, the CPU pins will be floating. Now, it is perfectly reasonable to say that we probably should have another uh, four more 74245s here, just to ensure that you know we don't have data going to the CPU for an en for banks that aren't enabled. And I might do that when I move it to a actual PCB. But for the time being, this is really all that needs to be done. Okay, so actually getting into this, let's just tuck this away. Good old breadboard. And our chips. 
Now, there is one interesting catch. Um, well, on the design sketch, I had the, the CPU bus on the bottom. In actuality, it needs to go on the top. You know, that's because I kind of want to sit like this, just below the bus. So we'd have the CPU buses here and then the data control lines, which are uh, one here and these two address lines go down to here. This does technically mean that this sketch is actually upside down. But it also means that the chips are upside down. For the um, 245s, which is, these are, that's what these three are, obviously. I apologize. I, yeah, I know that the, you can't read the writing on these particular chips. Or they're just that sort. Um, the A side is here and the B side is here. And the A side needs to talk to the CPU bus. That means that we need to have these chips with the pin 1 pointed up in this corner, which is against the text on the chip. And that's, uh, that's, that is always an uncomfortable way of working. I find it makes it very hard to really get the chip wiring right. I've screwed up multiple times, to be honest. So we will do straight upright for the time being. Now for the data lines, let me just grab some pins here. We want to have them lined up not too close together because we obviously need to wire the CPU, the, the CPU, the chips in. So something like this. And then the decoder would be here. So grabbing the data sheet. So data sheet, or at least the relevant page. The, the first pin, pin one, is actually going to be our directional pin. So that's what's going to attach to the read write line. And then the remainder pins on this side until um, the very bottom, which is ground, is going to be the A bus. And the other side, we have, you know, we have power on the top, we have the enable line, and then we have all the data pins. So the data is sort of shifting over by one. So taking the chip, and let's align it this way, should align like that. And then the next chip, like that, assuming I can actually get it in the holes. All right, time to <laughs> straighten the pins slightly more than they already are. I need to get one of those little pin straighteners. Those are really nice and I don't have one and they'd be useful in this scenario. And then the last one. So that gives us our control line, our, not control lines, our bus drivers, and then we will put this one over here like that. Okay, so let's pop these out, out of the way and get some connections for power in. All right, so these all being the same, ground is on the bottom of this side and then power is on the top. I do like the consistency of the chips and the way the power and ground are laid out. It's a, it makes it nice. Um, I not, I run into a few chips that don't do that. Primarily some earlier CPU models. Uh, Z80, for example, has the power in the middle of one side. Makes it a little bit annoying to work with, but not the end of the world. But this is just really nice and clean even when I do have to sort of work around the uh, bridging for the um, gaps in the breadboard. I'm not a fan of those gaps. All right, and then power. So power, 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 ground, 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 ground. All right, so that takes care of that. Now, since the uh, enable line is on this side, we're going to want to use this side of the one, uh, two to four decoder to, deter to actually enable that line, which I also have that data sheet here. So we have ground, uh, power, sorry, enable, and then you know the two inputs and the four outputs. 
and of course the right line. So let's get those wired up. Um, I'm gonna have to actually cut a couple cables here. So, Gain to the fun stuff. Now the good news is that on this side, these all have the um, direction line to here, and they basically conveniently enough just line together really nicely. So we can just daisy chain these three enable lines and then stick it somewhere out of the way. So. Uh, now, I'm going to warn you, I am not one of these super brilliantly accurate people who gets these perfectly straight lines on breadboards where all the cables are exactly the right size and nothing's ever out of place. I'm not that. I wish I could be that, but <laughs> I'm nowhere near that. So, I mean, there are some really beautiful breadboards out there. Uh, ben Eater, of course, is the one that comes to mind first. I've tried. I just don't quite have the measuring skill to make that work. See? All right. I'm just going to... I'm not going to put this one just now because it lets me measure the next one. So, yeah, my breadboards are going to be a bit on the... Um, expressive side of wiring. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a matter of making sure you can still work with the wires. I mean, it's nice to have a very pretty breadboard. You know, having everything really nicely lined and clean, nicely lined up and nice and clean and straight. It's a really nice thing. But, you know, you can't always do that. So you end up with little bits of loops and messes like mine. It is something I'm getting better at. You know, improved the tools. I mean, this this has been one of the greatest tools for stripping wires. <laughs> it just gets the length exactly right every time, which is nice. Now, I want to keep all the control lines over here. So, let's see, that one measure gets that. That would be there, because there's two in each. So, uh, ironically, I think I just need one more about the same length. So I would love to hear any tips you would have for, you know, as a viewer, that's probably too short, I'm going to go slightly longer, uh, for suggestions on how to improve the quality of my wiring on the breadboard. Uh, in fact, you know, advice and tips and whatnot are always appreciated. I'm I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm very much uh, a self-educated amateur, and I'm probably doing some things very wrong in times. So, you know, feel free to correct me. I, I would welcome that. You know, I have no, well, I do have pride, but I have no illusions on my abilities on this particular project. This is just for fun. You know, this, this started as an idea of like, well, I have it, Let's just do something with it, you know, you know, just screwing around and finding out, you know, in a good way, not, not the usual bad way. Okay. Those look good. Okay. So next we're going to need the control lines. Um, this has an enable, right? And that's just ground. So we will just tie that to ground for the time being, you know, I said, eventually that will be tied into the actual bus select line. But for now, we'll just ground it. Uh, so those are two. Next two lines are control lines. So then we have three lines to go into the actual chips. Uh, that's line one. And these are going onto the uh, top line right under power. So about there. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you sit through all of this. I have pre-cut most of the rest of the wires because uh, they're all standard. They're, they're all identical length, so that works really nicely. Let's just put that nice and nice and wide. All right. Um, yeah, they're all identical length, so I was able to cut pre-cut a whole bunch of them. Oh. I say pre-cut. I kind of did them in a previous attempt at recording that I uh, I messed up. 
always check your equipment, people. Because I don't. I'm still somewhat new at this. And uh, <laughs> it's embarrassing to do a really good run and then discover that the camera was off. Yeah. Always double check your equipment. You know, it was easier in the past because I was only doing audio. I did, you know, I've done podcasts in the past as well as some old Let's Plays back in the day. Long, long time ago. I don't recommend them. Uh, so, did I get those in the right spot? Two. Oh, nope, I'm a couple off. So, no. that one needs to be there. That one needs to be there. Well, gives me a little more slack on these cables. So, last one. There. We'll do that. I also am trying to color code them. Uh, I'm not sure how long that will last. Depends on how long my cables, my uh, wiring lasts. But the idea is that I want to use blue for the address lines, green for you know, the CPU control lines and orange for generated control lines. Okay. So that's the easy part. Now the fun part. I'm, I'm going to bump my microphone. Yes, now for the fun part. Lots of wires. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, luck luckily, we can make this one go fairly quick. Okay, and here we go. So this should, unless I manage to do something incredibly silly, should be all wired up correctly. So now we need to test it. Oh, luckily, I have tools for that. You know, familiar tools, <laughs> because these are incredibly useful little boards. So, let's get some power going. All right. Run that one there. That one there. This only needs ground, so we'll run it directly there. Uh, this one is ground here and power here. Okay, that should take care of that, hopefully. It's always embarrassing when you miswire or forget to wire a board, so always double check. All right, and First thing to do, of course, would be to test to make sure that the uh, decoder is working correctly. So for that, we'll use another one of these little LED boards. This one is wired up to be active high. So it's um, really convenient for this little sort of probing that we're doing here. So I'll plug that there. And uh, just grab the power cable, make sure I plug the right side. Power's always low down in my designs. Okay. So plug these four in to the data lines. 
All right, so there we are. Oh, we should probably actually plug the input lines into something, otherwise nothing's going to go anywhere anytime fast. So that one, mm, grab those two. All right, so zero there. So we will put both of these into low. So the input is zero, zero. So let's turn it on. Okay, that's great. That is what we want to see. It is the first one there. So zero, 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 one. Okay. Yeah, I got to put it down here technically. One, zero, also correct. And then one, one, also correct. And they're floating high, so that works easy as well. So that's fantastic. It means our data lines are working correctly. That's great. So we should stick these someplace to be controllable here. Well, let's just put them right here for the time being. So yep, that's exactly what we want to see. Fantastic. So data. Let's just remove these because they're not that not necessary anymore. Okay, so what we will do, there we are, is connect this uh, here and then here. So right now it's all zeros, so we'll set this to all ones. And then we'll just connect the output lines into the various LEDs. Let's see, everything going to be visible? I may need to adjust the, lay, the placement of stuff for the time in a moment. But for now, yeah, these, these LED boards are great. The only problem is that the uh, the alignment of the power pins and the data pins are set up for uh, unbroken breadboards where the power lines not separated, which is a problem because you know the ones where they are separated, the they just align differently. It's a little bit annoying. Okay. Oh, fantastic. That's actually what we want to see. But here, let me just push these down a bit. Good Lord, how am I going to get this so you can actually see everything? All right, there. So there we are. So we can see that we are running the right data. So we will just set up a nice well-known pattern. Now, if we change this to one zero, one one. Oh, right. I haven't set the direction line. It is currently set to the wrong value. Um, that would help. So, to let's see, it's probably defaulting high. So let's set to low. Set that to one. Oh look, that's what we want to see. It's moved to that one. We set to four, two there, one there. That is fantastic. That is exactly what I wanted to see. So we can now switch which bank the 8-bit data bus, which is this one, goes to depending on what the two address lines are. And of course, you know, the read light the read write lines will change depending. So that is fantastic. So this is working. So the next step would be to get um, an 8-bit bus wired into a ROM. But there are a couple additional things to worry about when it comes to ROMs, particularly the way the x86 places ROMs. Because x86, oh, we'll go into it more in the next episode, but needless to say, there are some interesting challenges with starting an x86 in real mode with a 32-bit data bus and a 32-bit address bus. And it is not the most straightforward thing in the world. So I said, we'll cover that next time. But for now, the next step is complete and uh, we're going forward. So thank you. Um, hope you enjoy this episode and I will see you next time.